It's all about the team. Uh, yeah. If you if you typically talk to an investor, right, they'll look at three uh, dimensions, right, uh, whenever they make an investment. So this is non-linear thinking. It's a very human-centric th thinking. A number of successful exits like Phantom Cyber, which was bought by Splunk, and Demisto, which was bought by Palo Alto, and I think Microsoft also bought something and IBM bought something, right? So you're saying it's not a zero-sum game anymore. In a startup, everybody is so interdependent on the other. Hello and welcome to another amazing episode of Pitch Cafe podcast. Today we have with us a very special guest from Silicon Valley. His name is Sanjay Soni. I met him about four years ago where he was working on his latest startup, which has got acquired and uh, it has had a successful exit. And when I went to meet him at the startup, the reason Sanjay created a very good impression on me was he has so much knowledge about the technology and the market he's in and so much in-depth knowledge that investors come to him for mentoring lessons. And I was part of that mentorship session, but also he had some really cool insights on leadership. It's very hard to come by technology experts who are also uh, with high EQ and strong leadership abilities. If you are a startup founder or want to be a startup founder and you're looking at the security space, Sanjay Soni is definitely the person who can be a super mentor for you with three successful startups uh, and moving on to his next venture. Sanjay has a lot of insights for first-time founders and seasoned founders as well. Without further ado, let's bring on Sanjay Soni. Sanjay, welcome to Pitch Cafe podcast. Thank you, Rida, and uh, thank you for the kind words as well. Um, yeah. And just to be clear, uh, everything that I know of is uh, thanks to people with whom I work and people for whom I work. Absolutely, Sanjay. I think you have a fantastic and dedicated team who were able to clock in long hours, but also you are a person who was motivating them to do that. So let's get uh, straight into the discussion here. Um, if you want to open the conversation uh, with the audience about your, uh, you know, tremendous experience in the security space, you know, what has been your stint in the security space? Why is it that you have so many startups, successful startups in, in this particular space? Yeah, I think uh, um, I've been in the security space for almost 25 years and I have seen um, the ups and downs and what works, what doesn't work. And um, I'm pretty much guided by whatever I've learned. And I would say every day is a new learning experience. So uh, uh, no one can claim to be an expert in this particular space. And there's always what I would say uh, lots of new things happening. Uh, people make all kinds of predictions uh, about the security space. You know, this technology is hot, this technology, this is the year of XDR, this is the year of SASE. But at the end of the day, the action in the security market is determined by someone who has the biggest say. Right. And that's the guy, the person called the hacker. <laughs> Gosh, this is the first time I'm uh, listening to someone who puts in so much power in the hands of a hacker. So tell us more about what, what a hacker can do and why security startups are scared of this guy. I think uh, you can uh, dream up about all kinds of uh, defenses, but at the end of the day, when there's a threat like, say, SSL Heartbleed, which uh, happened in 2014, or Log4j, which happened recently, or Colonial Pipeline attack, all the attention or oxygen is essentially sucked out by the threat of the day, the threat of the month, or the threat of the year. So uh, that's what everyone chases. But uh, uh, by the time they get to some kind of solution, the action shifts somewhere else. So uh, that's why it's an interesting month. Wow. With that uh, in mind, uh, I know that you, you, you're you on a roll, you're on a hat trick. It's your third startup now uh, with Tala Security. Uh, what is it like to build 
a feature of a platform or a standalone function what's the difference in the security space what is that what does that mean okay so uh, there's always been historically a debate about uh, whether security should be a feature or something else that a customer buys right like a client mm-hmm. a server or a switch or a router or uh, or some cloud capability right mm-hmm. or it should be a stand alone function uh, which right. is independent of the platform right and mm-hmm. there's no right and wrong answer uh historically at least what i have seen is um, in the first generation when the threat vector is really really quote unquote in the rocket science territory right mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. people uh, customers feel compelled to buy security as a standalone function which can respond uh, a lot quicker than um, let's say uh, the goliaths of this space you know um, mm-hmm. uh, um so uh, a classic example being in the mid 90s you know like uh, 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 there was this vendor called checkpoint right which uh, mm-hmm. was exclusively focused on network security and could respond a lot faster than the giants uh, who sold uh, a lot of the equipment to enterprises cisco mm-hmm. and other networking companies at that time so people f- felt uh, compelled to buy checkpoint as a firewall solution but mm-hmm. over a period of time when everyone understood how to defend basically network based attacks right. uh, literally every switch and router or even your home uh, net gear or like soho router pretty much has the capabilities that checkpoint did in mid 90s so nice. so 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 the point i'm making is that uh, in the first generation um, security almost always is a standalone function but over a period of time when people understand it well enough the defense and how to uh, incorporate that it invariably becomes as a, a feature of something else that a customer buys yeah so looks like the network um, control solutions are commoditized now they are parts of the network itself and uh, application and endpoint and data centric solutions are becoming more uh, the target for startups is that correct yeah i would say so the the network centric controls are uh, essentially uh, very limited uh, the latest incarnation of those is uh, you may have heard of the uh, sasi market or zero trust right so zero these are trust. yes these uh, uh, or zero trust network access uh, control yeah. right yeah. so these uh, are basically uh, the bare minimum one has to do but one should not be under any illusion that these are uh, effectively going to counter the sorts of threats that uh, uh, a typical uh, enterprise a financial institution or a, a government agency uh, encounters right so uh, network centric controls pretty much fall in that category the second point is like for a startup when you start small right you have to find something that will fit within an existing ecosystem mm-hmm. trying to uh, disrupt basically the networking uh, market or the network security market which is relatively uh, i would say more mature is is a, is a tough sell for a, an early stage startup right got it it seems like a complex and evolving space because the threats are also getting complex and evolving and the solutions are also becoming complex and evolving because so much data is out there and the ability to manage data and process data is also becoming complex right that's very very true and uh, um, in my uh, previous startup we used to get uh, uh, telemetry from millions of browsers just for a handful of uh, large enterprise customers we used to get like something more than like 10 million events a day oh from my gosh browsers wow. all over the world right oh my gosh and, right. and the vast majority was basically noise mm. but uh, uh, finding the uh, signal uh, or uh, what you might say like signal in a haystack noise. yeah yeah haystack little in a haystack right yeah. is uh, is where the uh, art is and uh, i in my experience ml data science uh, they are useful but not uh, a cure all and uh, lots of people don't like false positives and uh, yeah. uh, controlling false positives uh, without some ground truth as people call it right is very yeah. very difficult so so you know that's very uh, well well put 
if you look at uh, data centric security solutions which one will play better reactive and proactive or <laughs> or is it a hybrid or what what would be i think it will be a hybrid it will be, be a hybrid, hybrid. Okay. it will okay. be a hybrid fantastic so uh, you know what are some of the operational challenges you face in uh, uh, you know of of a ciso chief information security officer what are, what are some of the challenges you faced okay so i have spoken to various cisos in large enterprises and uh, the number one thing that keeps popping up is there's a scarcity of like top talent in security and why is, why is that there are very few people who really understand uh, the security technology very well right and the threat landscape very well so there's a there's a scarcity you you look at the number of jobs that typical enterprise has right, uh, right. and a lot of those uh, do have some component of uh, security knowledge right so that's the top uh, uh, i would say the top problem uh, most enterprises face that there's a lack of strong cyber security talent mm -hmm. and so um, now uh, with uh, with these various escalations and fires and other things that are going on uh, where do they have this top talent which is very scarce like what where do they deploy this talent right mm -hmm. so a lot of the enterprises uh, have recognized that uh, uh, they can't have like a top security guy re-image re laptops which was infected like a cookie cutter task right? right so what they started doing was increasingly relying on uh, basically automation to mm -hmm. do mundane cookie cutter tasks right, um, right. now my former uh, semantic colleagues uh, saurabh satish and uh, um, Uh, Oliver, uh, they uh, were amongst the first to start this market called uh, Secure SOAR, Security Orchestration and Response. Basically, mm -hmm. essentially, it was around automated response. Today, uh, in large enterprises, CISOs are more comfortable with automation to do mundane tasks, so mm -hmm. so that they don't uh, use their top talent to do uh, very uh, routine tasks. Right. So. Well That's, well justified that's very well justified what's right. the problem with that i think uh, there's there's not much problem with it uh, it has been very successful and uh, there have been uh, a number of successful exits like phantom cyber which was bought by splunk and demisto which was bought by palo alto and i think microsoft also bought something and ibm bought something right this is definitely uh, i would say a trend that these successful startups uh, exploited but the root cause is that there's a lack of cyber security talent mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, uh, cso's don't want to deploy their top security guys doing mundane cookie cutter things mm -hmm. now so this is one aspect now there's another aspect uh, uh, that uh, coming back to this ai and ml right mm -hmm. uh, so the problem here is most large enterprises they want determinism right they don't yeah. want probabilistic solution right imagine yeah. you go to an enterprise and say uh, like my magic ai and ml algorithm says that this employs an insider threat Gosh. Now, what if you were wrong? Yeah. What yeah. What if you were wrong, right? Yeah. So, most enterprises, what they want is they want uh, a precise trail of what led you to believe that uh, this is an insider threat. So you can't say my uh, my algorithm told me so or like something else, right? So, there is this concept of uh, uh, trustworthy uh, AI and ML, right? Like. Uh, yeah. uh, couple of uh, companies an important one called true era uh, started by um, anupam datta uh, from cmu and stanford right mm -hmm. um, which is uh, uh, not exactly in the security space broader space but uh, that's that's the kind of ai and ml that's more likely to be accepted within an enterprise what they call explainable ai mhm mm mhm mm right uh and then you said that um you have to leave the world of addition and subtraction in your leadership advice why did you say that okay and math totally makes sense but why okay. did you say that 
Okay, so um, I have seen uh, in some environments, like uh, people think of like uh, in larger, or especially in larger organization, oh, my gain is that guy's loss and that guy's uh, gain is my loss, <laughs> right? Yeah. So yeah. you can't think like that, especially uh, in a startup scenario, right? Um, you, uh, the moment you do that, the net output of uh, your startup will be uh, constrained by that, right? Even if you work twice as hard, right? And yeah. if there are four or five of you, right? If, uh, uh, unless you uh, change that mindset, right? Your output will be no better than that in a big company. Yeah. No, no, this is uh, very true. So you're saying it's not a zero sum game anymore. In a startup, everybody is so interdependent on the other. And, absolutely absolutely yeah, and you say graduate to the world of multiplication and think exponentiation what did you mean by that okay so when when i say uh, uh, people should graduate to the world of multiplication what i mean is like you think of like multiplying the strengths of your uh, members of your team right wow and uh, hopefully they have a positive uh, of say like 0.9 and maybe a negative of 0.1 right so if yeah. you multiply like say uh, uh, four individuals, right? 0. Yeah. 0.9 times 0. 0.9 times uh, 0. 0.9 times 0. 0.9, right? So basically the net output is better than uh, in an addition and subtraction scenario. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, got it. So this is non-linear thinking. It's a very human-centric right. th thinking. So startup is really a business of humans. It's not anything else. I completely agree with that. And uh, uh, exponentiation is uh, kind of what I would say is the next level up from multiplication, right? And uh, I mean, say I, I tend to think a little bit like more like a computer scientist, right? And uh, uh, exponentiation is uh, uh, like, you can think of it like a hyper growth, right? Exactly. A hyper growth or a, a hyper sensitive parameter, right? If, sure. if you adjust the exponent or the base, right, it yeah. can make significant differences in output compared right. to, say, like addition and subtraction uh, Definitely. scenario. Definitely. And, you know, Sanjay, such exciting thoughts here. Um, uh, definitely in startup world, uh, you have to have so many scales of thinking. You covered the technology side. You covered um, new ways of looking at leadership as a uh, techie in a startup. Now, uh, as, a, as a parting thought to our listeners, uh, what kind of advice do you have for leaders in the technology domain today? What should and what should they not do? Okay, I think the number one thing, uh, it's all about the team, mm. <laughs> right? Yes. Uh, yes. If, you, if you typically talk to an investor, right, they'll look at three uh, dimensions, right? Uh, whenever they make an investment, yeah. um, market team and technology and yeah. they'll list it in that order mm -hmm. i would list it in a slightly different order mm -hmm. i would list it in terms of team market and technology and the reason why i'm uh, 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 swapping market and team is if you have the right team they'll figure out it'll figure out you're not in the right market and pivot very quickly correct right? so correct the uh, team is the most important element and uh, all aspects, you know, um, you can you can put uh, 10 hot shots in a room, but the net output could still be zero because they're always arguing and fighting Absolutely. as opposed to doing something, right? Absolutely. So a team that is complementary and basically is action oriented. Uh, Fantastic. This is very good advice. I remember this was one of the most uh, resounding uh, advice I heard, you know, back then it just etched in my mind. In fact, you said team, 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 and then everything else. You were like very emphatic about it when you spoke to the investor, in, you know, uh, when I met you first time. So, you know, with that, with such a jam-packed, insightful session, I have to call the session to a close with a lot of reluctance. Uh, thank you, Sanjay ji, for this amazing uh, half hour or so where you spilled beans of wisdom. And uh, we definitely hope to bring you again on this podcast with your new, uh, latest ventures. Thank you once again for being part of this show. Thank you, Vida. I appreciate it. Thank you.